The parallels between uh, the Soviet version of economic and financial warfare against the U.S., which, I'll, which we actively countered and ultimately led to its demise, and that of China, which is a much larger juggernaut, to be sure, much more diversified, much more capable economically and financially. You can't really compare the two. But there are certain similarities, and I think that's what Chet was looking to draw out. The similarities are that, that we were reacting to an effort by the Soviets at the time to use basically natural gas sales to Western Europe as a weapon of coercion, ultimately, that would be used at the appropriate level of dependency of Western Europe on Soviet natural gas supplies. So <clears throat> the Siberian gas pipeline uh, was the project at the time that was underway at the very moment that the Soviets were massing troops on the Polish border uh, to invade in the event that solidarity wasn't crushed and, and uh, Pope John Paul silenced. Uh, Reagan took a strong, President Reagan took a strong position on this and said that's not happening on his watch. <clears throat> but here's the kicker on the financial and economic side. The Siberian gas pipeline would have taken Western Europe's dependency on Soviet gas to well over 70 percent, maybe 80 percent. Now, you know President Reagan, uh, President Trump has been very concerned and actually called Germany a kind of wholly owned subsidiary of Russia today at 35 percent. Just imagine how he'd feel had there been no Reagan at, say, 75 or 80 percent. But we were also, we the West, in the form of Western governments and banks, financing the totality of the hard currency costs of the Soviet empire worldwide, which are about $16 billion at the time. The Soviets only had total hard currency income of, say, $32 billion in 1981-82, one-third of the revenues of a General Motors or an Exxon at the time. And so we found ourselves, in a sense, picking up the tab for the better part of the Soviet empire and, in effect, treating these gas sales as commercial when, indeed, they were strategic. So we obviously wanted to cap Soviet gas deliveries to Western Europe to 30 percent, which we did. We eliminated the subsidized taxpayer underwritten interest rates on government credits. We dried up the private credit markets. We told the Saudis to pump two million barrels more, or more a day. We decontrolled prices at the wellhead, lowering oil prices to $10 a barrel, knowing that the Soviets were 66 percent of their earning structure was dependent on oil and gas sales. So it's a petro nation then and now. And obviously, for every dollar drop in the price of a barrel of oil, they lost 500 to a billion dollars in that income. Basically, we broke them into matchsticks over time. They weren't going to recover from that. Now, China, again, is different. But instead of, if you think about the subterranean nature, literally in some cases, of natural gas flows into Western Europe, today China has selected our capital markets. You know, nobody ever regarded natural gas as being weaponized. Nobody, there was no such thing as pipeline politics. They had never pulled the trigger on extorting NATO the way they surely would have had they ever had dependencies like the ones they were seeking. They would have. Reagan knew they would. We knew they would. It was a small cadre up against the rest of conventional wisdom, which was that this is a permanent fixture on the landscape of the globe and you'll never, the Soviet Union is going to be there for our children's children's children and we better live with it. Today we're told the same thing about China. So what, what you're not ever hearing about, interestingly, is the money. And that is the parallel that I would draw. 
I mean, the, 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 the Thrift Savings Plan Board, as I said, an announced all the top American companies, all the top American pension systems, public state pension systems, all of the defense contractors, they're all in the game, therefore it's okay. Well, there was just a few of us, as Chet remembers in the old days, that, that went against that conventional wisdom and said, no, 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 not on my watch. And there is no Soviet Union today. Now, that's where we are, in a sense. We're at that crossroads. And this is moving at a very fast clip. So we have to get religion on this uh, pretty darn fast if we're going to get a, you know, keep, a, keep, our, keep that lobby, if you will, that we talked about earlier, that lobby of scores of millions of Americans who are going to have that vested financial interest for a hands-off China policy. Well, if it's a hands-off China policy, I can tell you, we're done. Yeah, one might say the hands will be around our throats. Um, Dr. Pry? I would, I would say that um, money is a gateway. I mean, when you're, when you're in the financial industry to this regard, to this extent, not only do you have the funds to buy those strategic assets and, and get into those key startups that we're relying on for our innovation future, which they're single-mindedly focused on doing, there is an interconnection there that just doesn't quit. And we've looked at the technology piece, which is key, and we've gone after ZTE and Huawei and a number of other of the companies, thank goodness. But, and we've certainly gone after the trade imbalances on the tariff side and the like, but again, where's the key pillar, pillar three? What about the money? Because unfortunately, it's the money that lubricates China's technology theft. It's the money that gives them the swat to intimidate regional neighbors. Not to mention uh, Wall Street, who's being told that if they don't behave like good boys and girls, they're going to be out of this fantastic Elysian field marketplace that they've been advertising since the near the beginning of time, it feels like. So th this is a blind spot that doesn't quit. And I can tell you that if we address the money, you're going to find, big surprise, that the rest of our national security challenges become vastly more manageable. That's a great point, Peter. Part of this is an intellectual problem, isn't it? We just don't get it. It'd be one thing if China were on the path toward becoming more free and open and democratic. But all this thing, all that Roger's been describing is taking place as China is becoming more repressive. 
and less democratic. I mean, they, they were never democratic per se, but that idea that economic freedom would lead to political freedom, that didn't happen, not going to happen. What, what really should bother us is that it's almost as if the cancer has spread so far among the American political and economic elites that the, the body politic is going to die. That once it spreads this far, China is making the bet that we're in too deep. We've got them. They're not going to back out now. We have them right where they want them. Right, right, we have them right where they, you know, they want them. And it is partly a contest between globalism and economic nationalism. Trump represents America first and economic nationalism. This is an assault on that. Wall Street's betting that globalism is going to win. And it's almost like a religion. Not sure they're making money on it, but their entire goal is to intertwine our economy with theirs in such a way that there's no way to back out of it. What Roger's saying is we need to focus on that right now. We need to find a strategy for getting out of this mess because at a certain point here, there is no backing out. And we're doomed. But, of course, we believe we can fix all that. Joe Bosco? I have two comments, but why don't we have that gentleman ask his question? Well, we'll get to him. Okay. Uh, Brian just mentioned something he said in his speech, that there's been a prevailing conventional wisdom that uh, China, if, if uh, China and the Soviet Union earlier, if they were integrated into the international uh, system, they would moderate their policies and become more liberal and democratic. I think that's a very generous assessment, frankly. There are people, important decision makers, who've never cared whether China became democratic. They simply accepted it as a dictatorship that exists in the world and we can do business with them. And that's what we've done. And I'm, Henry Kissinger is probably the leading exponent of that view. Read his books and see how much description discussion you find of human rights and whether there is an expectation that China will ever become uh, an integrated member of the international community. The other point is that I was struck by what Kyle Bass said in that video. The reason China is not willing to disclose uh, the transparency that we expect of other companies was the term, it's not in China's national security interest. This is worse than Orwell. This is Alice in Wonderland. We're willing to jeopardize our national security because China says for them to play the game like everyone else jeopardizes their national security. So we've said, okay, yours trumps ours. This is incredible, the, the situation. Well, it's not just incredible. I think it's obscene, personally. Um, let me just add a, a quick point, and then we'll, we'll come to several others of you who want to pose questions. Um, on Peter's question, and, and there was a very nice compliment to Roger Robinson, I don't know if the mics picked it up, but um, as to your suggestion about making his presentation available, not just to members of Congress, but to the world, that's part of what we are doing here with the Committee on the Present Danger, China, and I just want to emphasize again, um, I'm extremely proud and want to thank Brian and uh, our, our team that has been backstopping at uh, the presentdangerchina.org site is really one-stop shopping on all of these issues and, and many others because what we're trying to do is really raise awareness about the broad thrust of what the Chinese have called unrestricted warfare that they've been waging against us. And the fact that they have been waging it against us and the fact that we've known about it since a book was published by two People's Liberation Army senior colonels back in 1999 makes what we've just heard even more obscene. We've been on notice that, among other techniques, economic warfare is one of the vectors that they are using to take us down, to accomplish what uh, Joe was just talking about. The other thing I just wanted to mention, which is in the nature of good news, I think, 
Um, I have not met her yet. I hope we might have an opportunity for her to participate in one of these programs at some point. But Under Secretary of Defense Ellen Lord has unveiled an initiative to encourage patriotic investment. I think she has understood the problem that we're talking about here. We've heard from the Secretary of the Navy. He certainly understands it. But the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition, Ellen Lord, has been initiating, as I understand it, an effort to encourage people to make investments in America, patriotic investments in our security with our companies to enhance our competitiveness, both for commercial purposes, presumably, but also, obviously, for national security. And I just had a conversation earlier this week with an individual who I've known for a long time, been in the national security space on the uh, chip and internet sort of side of uh, our incredible national capabilities. And he said, for the first time in 40 years working in that space, three weeks ago, somebody, I don't know whether it was Ellen Lord, but I suspect it was, but somebody met with him and other senior people in Silicon Valley, both on the technology side and on the venture capital side. And they heard for the first time a very clear warning about what they were doing with their technology, what they were doing in selling their technology or their companies, what they were doing by partnering in venture capital initiatives with Chinese entities that is detrimental to the security of the United States. So whoever did that, I hope it was his Lord, but whoever did it, uh, thank you for that. And it's a starting point, I think, for the kind of things that we've been talking about here need to be done. And we look forward to working with them in accomplishing it. Preston. Thank you, Frank. This unconscionable investment that militarily enables China to our detriment is simply breathtaking. And so I'd like to ask you something I think is probably really difficult, but I'll ask it anyway. If you could please craft for me, for my benefit and others' benefits, a 30 to 45 second soundbite slash elevator speech that I can use with people to alert them to this. <laughs> what? Always the easy questions. <clears throat> China has come to our markets with stock and bond offerings and extracted arguably trillions of dollars from our economy and into their own. It's been happening without any screening, with no disclosure, in contravention of U.S. securities laws. <clears throat> it has been calloused and insensitive to human rights, that it's never seen the light of day in U.S. government deliberations or those of the media or even in cocktail conversations of the American people. It has heretofore been unknown a secret, in effect, strategy with the complicity of those who have something to gain. It's insidious, and it needs to be stopped now and disciplined and made compliant, or the consequences will be ruinous for the United States. I would add to that, when you're buying a Chinese stock, you're betting on its success. These are state-owned enterprises. When you have trillions of dollars coming into the U.S. capital, I mean, being taken out of the U.S. capital markets, we are saying we are betting on the success of communist China and their communist state-owned enterprises. That seems to me, for most Americans, a, a you know, threshold question that most people would say, well, no. And also, we talk, this is something I've always wanted to get from Roger. There's a, there's a trade deficit, and the president makes a big deal about the trade deficit. 
What about the finance deficit? Because your main point here, isn't it, that the finance matters more than the trade? It is. And so, this may be a rhetorical question, but the trade deficit is one thing and it's important. The finance deficit is what's really critical. We, uh, yes, John. Yeah, the, uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question, which is, this is an educational process. People are just learning about this. The Chinese seem to be noticing that we're, we're catching up with them, that we, figure, we have figured out what Roger is, has known for all these years and been describing all these years. What is, the, what is China going to do to punch back, as it were? I would start by saying, and then I'd love to hear what Roger and Joe think, I think the Chinese figure, this nationalism, this is all Donald Trump. Let's wait him out. Let's see what happens next year. Is he going to survive politically? Let's do everything in our power to make sure he doesn't survive. Let's make life difficult for him. And if we don't make a trade deal, we don't make a trade deal. Guys like Trump are pretty rare. Guys who really stand up for American interests. Most of these Republicans and Democrats in the future They'll go back to the globalist mindset. Let's just wait them out. And so it seems to me their strategy is make life difficult for Donald Trump and his reelection. If they can get through that, they're, they're almost home free. If not, you know, they can adapt. They're playing a long game. And they know that American political and financial elites are corrupt. They know that already. And they're, they're really... The only thing that can stop that is if Donald Trump wakens the economic nationalism of the American people, which I believe he's doing and which you're, which you're suggesting. Joe, Roger. <clears throat> well, I think that uh, basically on the punchback, we're seeing it beginning now. The TSP board, the Thrift Savings Plan board, has hunkered down and made a decision after kicking the can down the road three or four times. That decision was to reaffirm that they're going with the MSCI All Country World Index XUS. Now, that is going to be symptomatic of how they play this out. Think of the letters NBA, and you've got a good guidepost. They're going to intimidate Wall Street players like something you've never seen. After all, they strong-armed, according to the Wall Street Journal, MSCI, to buy the A shares, unregulated, out of the uh, Chinese mainland exchanges to begin with. That's a matter of record. And what are they going to do if MSCI All Country World or its emerging market index, which is filling up with Chinese companies at an alarming pace, what happens if they decided to shed hike vision 
because the heat got too intense on those natty concentration camps and Tibetan suppression. They probably might even be tempted. But the scathing attack that would come from, and the consequences that would come from Beijing will stay their hand. It's almost amazing. Hikvision's on the entity list. Their parent company has been on the entity list for a year for national security abuses. They're the poster child of human rights abuses. Is it, isn't it a no-brainer to simply divest that one company? And yet, no one has. Not the FTSE Russell, not the S&P Dow Jones, not the Bloomberg Barclays, if they even have them, I can't speak to that one, but certainly MSCI. Isn't it fascinating? Not one company of the types that Frank regaled us with have been divested. Now, that is Chinese intimidation. And that is greed on the part of Wall Street. They're more worried about offending China than they are standing up for our values, our security interests, and even federal securities laws and are willing to ignore material risk to share value and corporate reputation that's putting American investors in harm's way. So that's the counterpunch of Beijing, and it is underway. Now, whether it's via Wall Street or directly, in the case of the NBA itself, it doesn't really matter. We're going to be looking for effects. And we have to look no further than today's discussion. And that's just the beginning. If you think they're going to go quiet, they don't talk about this, you notice, because they still are praying that this will go into deep freeze for another 20 years and not be in one conversation in one part of America for another 20 beyond that. But so they don't want to raise attention to it, but behind the scenes, you can hear the arms being twisted. Let me just emphasize one point. It's illegal to do business with some of the companies we are investing in. How can that be? Where, where is the SEC? Where are the oversight committees in the Congress? What Roger's suggesting, implicitly at least, is there is a level of corruption at work here. Maybe it's threats, maybe it's just the opportunity to garner still more money, but the practical effect of what is happening here is that our statutes, our laws are being violated to the benefit of enemies of this country who are beavering away at trying to make us more vulnerable, not just to their pressure, but to their domination. I think we have another question here. Yes, ma'am. Would you identify yourself? I, I've forgotten to ask that of others, but if you would, please. You'll need to speak up, please. It's hard to quantify, but it's in the billions of dollars, would be my answer to your first question. As far as the consequences of, of investing in companies on the entity list, 
You want to talk about loopholes. No penalties in the United States. You can hold OFAC sanctioned companies outright. No consequence, no problem. It's as though they're lily white American counterparts. It's just remarkable. So we have statutes that need to be written here. We have executive orders that need to be proclaimed here. We have possibly the use of the International Emergency Economic Powers Act of the president that's being screamed for at some level if all else fails. Do we have the authorities? Oh, yes. But the fact that, again, you can have these glaring inconsistencies is a shocker. And then to see the TSP board use terms like, we're being prudent and we're being appropriate for TSP members. You know, there's a, almost a cognitive dissonance at work here. There's a, if you, believe, if you believe it enough, it becomes true. I mean, the, the wagons are circled and hermetically sealed like something you'll rarely witness in our lifetime. We're finally, finally, from a national security point of view, in the promised land. We're finally in the zone. The money. Yes, go ahead. Yes. I'm from Laos, Serbian, SNCD. So I, I just want to know the Trump administration's stance on this problem. Uh, Roger and, and Colby talked about you know, uh, the Reagan administration. Um, that are, I mean, Reagan is the reason why the Soviet Union was shut down or why this economic warfare. I believe, as I said at one of our previous meetings, if the president himself understood all of these details, he would do exactly what Roger has described. I think the administration right now is looking very hard at all the trade matters that's being negotiated heavily. I believe all the, you know, the whole question of the theft of intellectual property is being discussed at very high levels, and I think those are the two main priority interest when it comes to China, just on the money side. I do think this is of great concern to the administration, given the fact that the president has stated publicly that he is deeply concerned about what China is doing when it comes to human rights abuses and their military buildup. And because there is still parts of the government that are looking at things like the entity list, that do follow these things. I do believe the administration is concerned about this. But it's one of those things that, given all the things that they have to deal with, to the extent that public opinion can be shaped by this group in these meetings, and that more and more Americans can understand this problem, the better off we will be, and the greater I think the administration will have an opportunity to focus on this. Let me say as an aside, um, Roger gave a talk at Hillsdale College, we're here at the, at the Kirby Center here in Washington. This month they did their imprimis featuring Roger's speech, and it goes to like five million Americans. I was told by one of its vice presidents that it was one of the most popular issues that they've ever had, that the response was overwhelming, that Americans are concerned about this, and it was something they hadn't heard about before. And so that's encouraging to me. And if we can take that enthusiasm and transfer it to the administration, I think the better off we'll be. Roger, do you want to say something further? Yeah, very quickly. Quickly. Yeah. Like most administrations, and I've served in one, uh, 
they sometimes are, I don't want to, how do I frame this? A house divided is too strong. Uh, different views is a more diplomatic way of putting it. Uh, depends what your mandate is, what your perspective is on this matter. But it doesn't have a unified view, the administration, best I know, which is quite natural because there are lots of folks that are trying to protect the momentum of the U.S.-China relationship. They see this as a potential irritant, to say the least. Um, so we'll have to overcome some of that reflexive instincts on the part of some to try to keep it kind of off the front page, if you will, uh, from their perspective. Um, however, I think progress is being made, and I think the sensitivities and the good people are there to recognize this and act on it. So I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that we'll see with the groundswell of the type that Brian's referring to, of the six pieces of legislation, four in the Senate and two in the House. In other words, this is not going to, this genie is not going back in the bottle. This bell is not going to be unrung. So it's time to step up. And I think the administration will do so. But again, it takes some acclimating.